Happy Sunday evening. Let's try that again. Happy Sunday evening. I love that song. If ever there was a Seventh Heaven song, that is it. Wings of prayer take me there, the sanctuary. Where does God live in the sanctuary? And it is only as we understand the sanctuary and what Jesus is doing there that we'll have the strength to overcome in these last days. You see, it's amazing because our understanding of the gospel is totally different than the evangelical and Protestant world. It's totally different. And why? Because of our understanding of the sanctuary. When we understand what Jesus is doing on our behalf right now, there's a power. There's a power there. Now, I'm not going to change the sermon, but, but I praise God for that song. And I give a shout out to my friends from BAA right here. So I'm so glad they were able to come with us. And, uh, and I praise God because the enemy's been attacking all of us today. All of us. And I was actually afraid that they might not even be able to sing today. But I praise God that they're here, all of them. And, uh, and, uh, I don't want to embarrass them too much, but, uh, but I'll take a bullet for these kids any day of the week. Seriously, and I mean that sincerely. I'm sorry? Amen. Amen. And we praise God that our God is infinitely more powerful than the enemy. We praise God for that. Tonight's message is a solemn one. And that's why I believe the enemy has been attacking. There are those messages that when they're presented, the enemy goes into overtime. And I have no doubt that just about every speaker presented this weekend can tell you stories of when they're about to present, the enemy goes into work to try to distract and discourage and prevent the word from being proclaimed. But I praise God, like I just said, we're not going to let the enemy win tonight. Or better yet, our God is not going to be in one tonight. And even though decisions have been made all weekend long, I do believe that there's still one more decision to be made. And by God's grace tonight, I pray that that person will make it. So that being said, let's have a word of prayer, and we'll get right into it. Our kind and gracious Father in heaven, Lord, we thank you for allowing us to be a part of this mountaintop experience. We thank you for the messages. We thank you, Father God, for the lives that have been touched, for the lives that have been changed, for the new births today in baptism. We thank you, Father God, for all those who have come forward. We thank you, Father Heaven, for allowing us to still have this freedom to come and gather and worship. In many places around the world, this freedom does not exist. And Lord, we know that according to Bible prophecy, very soon we'll lose that freedom here as well. And in many ways, it's already been lost. And so, Father, tonight, we invite your Holy Spirit's presence. We pray, Father God, that every heart is softened, each mind is opened, and may we allow the Holy Spirit to do its work in our life. May we not resist. Father, heaven, Lord, you know what's going on with me. Be with my words, my thoughts. Hide me behind the cross of Christ. We only pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Exodus chapter 12. Exodus chapter 12. After 400 years of oppression and slavery, after generations of bondage, after this long, dark night, in the chapter 
of the existence of the people of God. The hour had finally come for them to be delivered from the house of bondage, which was in Egypt. The ten plagues had all but destroyed that proud nation. Pharaoh, who was considered God on earth, was quickly reminded that there is another God, the true God, the creator God, the one who sits on the throne of the universe. He is the one true God. And Pharaoh was humbled, defeated, his kingdom in ruins. And finally, after the tenth plague that took the life of all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, save those who were covered by the blood of the lamb, Pharaoh finally agreed to let Israel go. Now follow me because we're going somewhere. And so a nation arose out of Egypt. One that was to be a holy nation. A kingdom of priests. A royal priesthood. A nation that was to be the light of the world, the salt of the earth, the depositories of God's truth and law, a nation that was to shine among all the nations of the earth as a beacon of light and truth and hope. A nation that God placed at the crossroads of the ancient world so that all travelers from Europe, Africa, and Asia would cross through Israel and there Israel would be a witness to the nations of the glories of the one true God of heaven and earth. The creator God, the loving God, the coming God. And so they left Egypt. This mighty nation marching towards the promised land. But as they left Egypt, someone else went with them. Exodus 12. Hearing God through relationships or not, stay with me. As they left Egypt, someone else went with them. Verse 37 of Exodus 12, the Bible says, And the children of Israel journeyed from Ramses to Sukkoth, about 600,000 on foot that were men beside children. Now you got to understand that in the Old Testament, you are not considered a man until the age of 20. If you're 19, you're not a man yet. So 600,000 men, 20 and above, who knows how many 19 and below and how many when you're talking two to four million people easily leaving Egypt. But someone went with them. Verse 38. And a mixed multitude went up also with them and flocks and herds and every and very much cattle. A mixed multitude went with them. And in this multitude, you not only had those who were moved by faith in the God of the Hebrews, but you also had many who were simply coming along for the ride. They wanted to escape the plagues that fell on Egypt in case others would fall. And some were curious to see this land flowing with milk and honey that they had heard about. And it was this group, this mixed multitude, 
that was always a snare to Israel. They were a hindrance. They always distracted. They always persuaded the people to do things that they otherwise would not have done. And it was this mixed multitude that leavened the camp with their idolatrous practices, with their constant murmuring and complaints against God. The mixed multitude. But they wanted a share in the inheritance of Israel, of the land of Canaan. They wanted a piece of that land. They wanted the promise that God gave to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And it was this mixed multitude that traveled with Israel, but were never really a part of Israel. Come on now. They were with Israel, but they were not of Israel. They tagged along with them, but they were not a part of the people of God. It was they who caused most of the trouble on the way to the promised land. They were the authors of most of the apostasies and rebellions that delayed the entrance into the promised land for 40 years. You see, they professed to have renounced idolatry. They, they professed to be followers of the God of the Hebrews. They professed to worship the one true God of heaven. But they never fully renounced their upbringing. They never unlearned their pagan ways. Follow me. Their early education or lack of it had molded and shaped their characters that they were still corrupt with idolatry and irreverence for God. Always complaining. Nothing pleased them. Nothing satisfied them. Nothing suited them. And because of this, they were overthrown in the wilderness. And they were not allowed to enter into the promised land. We read about this in Psalms 106. Let's go there. We're going somewhere. Psalms 106. Psalms 106, verse 24. The Bible says, Psalms 106, verse 24, the Bible says, Yea, they despised the pleasant land. They believed not his word, but murmured in their tents, and hearkened not unto the voice of the Lord. Hearing God through relationships or not. Three days after the mighty miracle of the Red Sea, one of the greatest miracles in the entire Bible, three days later, the complaints began. And these complaints originated with the mixed multitude. Now, I didn't have a PowerPoint on purpose. And I brought my books here for one simple reason. Read it. Read it. Thank you. Pastor Mirage, boldly, and I heartily amen. Ellen White is a prophet of God. No embarrassment, no shame about it. And yet, these books collect dust. 
Liam, I promise you it'll change your life. That's another sermon. I quote, page 377. After three days' journey, how many days? I mean, the, the, the Red Sea. The, the, the Red Sea. Three days later, open complaints were heard. These originated with the mixed multitude many of whom were not fully united with Israel and were continually watching for some cause of censure. The mixed multitude. The complainers were not pleased with the direction of the march, and they were continually finding fault with the way in which Moses was leading them, though they all well knew that he, as well as they, was following the guiding cloud. They could see the cloud. The visible presence of God, and they know Moses is following the cloud. Moses, why are you taking this, this direction? What's wrong with you, Moses? Stay with me. We're going somewhere. Dissatisfaction is contagious. And it soon spread in the encampment. The mixed multitude. And notice again, the mixed multitude was not fully united with Israel. They were with them but they were not really a part of them. And the dissatisfaction became contagious because misery loves company. And it spread throughout the camp. And it was the result of the mixed multitude. Now follow me. This mixed multitude even after the mighty miracle of the Red Sea, one of the greatest miracles of all time, the mixed multitude caused the camp to forget that event, to ignore it, because the mixed multitude had contaminated the people to cause them to join in their complaint and murmuring. You know, follow me. This mixed multitude caused God's people to forget the mighty miracle of the Red Sea and to complain against Moses and God. Dissatisfaction is contagious. The first great apostasy, the first great apostasy took place at the foot of Mount Sinai three months after the Red Sea. And just days after God displayed his glorious power in coming down on Mount Sinai with fire and smoke and earthquake and hailstones, causing the entire mountain to shake at his presence and speaking his holy law. We read it. Page 315. Read it. Feeling, well, during this period of waiting, Moses by the mountain, there was time for them to meditate upon the law of God which they had heard and to prepare their hearts to receive further revelations that he might make to them. You see, don't, don't, don't watch the movies. They, they, they get it all wrong. Come on. When God gave his law, he spoke it first, and the entire nation heard it. Then Moses goes up to get the Ten Commandments, the tables. Right. Right. Don't they had none too much time for this work, 
And had they been thus seeking a clear understanding of God's requirements and humbling their hearts before him, they would have been shielded from temptation. But they didn't do this. And they soon became careless, inattentive, and lawless. Parentheses. It was said yesterday, and our dad believe also, that whenever we give something up for God, God gives us something better. Amen? And when we give up all the wasted time in movies, all the waste of time on social media, all the waste of time on, 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 on whatever, YouTube or whatnot. When we give up that waste of time, we have to replace it with time spent with God in his word, in prayer, meditating, learning, drawing closer to him. If we don't, we will not be shielded from temptation. Because the devil says, oh, so you want to see what I see, huh? Oh, you want to get rid of your movies, huh? Oh, you want... okay, yeah, well, guess what? Here comes a triple powerful temptation. Stay with me. I'm going somewhere. Especially, was this the case with the mixed multitude? They were impatient to be on their way to the land of promise. The land flowed with milk and honey. It, it was only on condition of obedience that the goodly land was promised to, promised to them. But they had lost sight of this. There were some who suggested to return to Egypt. But whether forward to Canaan or backward to Egypt, the masses of the people were determined to wait no longer for Moses. So again, we find that the mixed multitude, those who were with Israel, but not a part of Israel, they managed to once again cause the people to forget the glorious power of God that was just displayed. Causing them to forget what had just happened in majestic power in the giving of his law. The mixed multitude were so influential that they caused nearly the entire nation to forget that they had just heard the voice of God, seen the fire, heard the law spoken by God himself, to forget the man that, the man that fell a few days earlier, to forget the miraculous providence of God, to forget the Red Sea, to forget the ten plagues that fell on Egypt, to forget all of that and to bow down to a golden calf. The mixed multitude. The mixed multitude. Not only do they cause problems and contaminate the camp with their complaints and murmurings and idolatrous ways, but they also hated and complained about God's health laws. They were the ones that began to lust after the diet they had while in Egypt. They were the ones that reminded the Israelites of what they had to eat while in Egypt. And they began to complain of the food. They began to complain of the diet that God had given them. Mm. We all coming back to this in a minute. I was talking to Brother Scotty Mayer this afternoon. The New Age movement has stolen our health message. The world has stolen our health message. But we got to have our carne asada. I'll come back to that. I'll come back to that. But we notice 
that this mixed multitude, because the Lord knew of the negative influence that they would have, the Lord did something that most of us here would have a problem with. 375. Most of us would have a problem with this. We would, we would call this unloving. I quote, the position of each tribe was also specified. Each was to march and to encamp beside its own standard as the Lord had commanded. So you couldn't encamp anywhere you wanted. No, Judah here, Levi there, Dan there, Ishakar there, Zebulon there, Nephilim there, Benjamin over here. You had a camp next to your standard with your tribe. The mixed multitude that had accompanied Israel from Egypt were not permitted, were not permitted to occupy the same quarters with the tribes, but to abide upon the outskirts of the camp. Oh, God, God, God wouldn't be that mean. God said, that mixed multitude that came with you. They will not live with you. They will camp outside the camp. And watch this. And their offspring will be excluded from the community until the third generation. So if I was part of this multitude, my child, I couldn't. My child couldn't. My grandchild couldn't. My great-grandchild could now live with the camp. Within the camp. Separate from the people of God. So we find that because of the influence of this mixed multitude, the people were led astray. They were the cause of the rebellions. They contaminated Israel with lack of faith, with their idolatrous ways. They kept Israel from hearing the voice of God. Hearing God through relationships or not. We're going somewhere. Even though they could visibly see the presence of God in the cloud by day, and pillar of fire by night, even though they were fed with manna for 40 years, even though they had seen the glorious works of God, they still could not hear his voice. And why? Because of the mixed multitude. Amos 3. Amos 3. Verse 3, the Bible says, Can two walk together except they be agreed? Now follow me. The mixed multitude and the Hebrew nation walked together. And sooner rather than later, the Hebrew nation began to walk in agreement with the mixed multitude. In agreement with their complaints and the rebellion. Because when two that don't agree walk together, one of two things is going to happen. One, they will part ways and separate. Or two, they will come to walk together in agreement, but agreement in what is the question? Romans 15, verse 4. At 9.05. Romans 15, verse 4. The Bible says, if you're there, please say amen. 
Romans 15, verse 4. Are we there, amen? Yes. The Bible says, For whatsoever things were written aforetime were written for our learning, that we through patience and comfort of the Scriptures might have hope. Ecclesiastes 1. Ecclesiastes chapter 1. The Bible says, verse 9. Ecclesiastes 1, verse 9. Watch this. That, the thing, the thing that has been, it is that which shall be. And that which is done is that which shall be done. And there's no new thing under the sun. You've arrived. Hearing God through relationships or not. Fast forward some 3,500 years. Not much has changed. Only now the stakes are much higher as we are now truly living in the closing moments of this history. But God's remnant end time church, the Advent movement, today we face the same problem, the same dangers, the same temptations. Why? Because there is most definitely a mixed multitude in our ranks. And who are they? You know, I love CYC. Because up here, we give the politically incorrect truth because there is nothing politically correct about the gospel. Amen. Now, let me just say something before I move forward. I'm smiling. If you go to a restaurant and the waiter brings the food, and the food is horrible. It is rancid. Does it make any sense to get mad at the waiter? Why not? I'm the waiter. You got a problem with the food, you take it with the chef. <laughs> Amen. I'm a messenger boy. I didn't cook the food. I just brought it to you. Got a problem? Take it with the chef. Amen. Now, remember, the wheat and tares grow what? Together. And it is not our job to pluck them out. But we can and must identify them. By their fruits you shall... So we are not to be fruit pickers, but we are to be fruit inspectors. Mm, Y'all don't like that. I'm getting ahead of myself here. If you belong to this church and don't believe in Alan White, you're a tear. Amen. Mm-hmm. You don't believe in God's prophet? You're a tear. But who are they? They are the murmurers, the complainers, the criticizers, the gossipers, the backbiters, the idolaters, the fornicators, the adulterers, the worldly element who are always lusting after the things of the world. Always desiring the things of Babylon. We're going to narrow it down just a minute. They are the unconverted, the half converted, who have a theory of the truth without the power of the gospel. They are Babylonians, or at best only half Christians and half worldly, in other words, half Israelite, half Egyptian. And as I tell my kids all the time, there's no such thing as a part-time Christian. God will have all of you 
or none of you. They follow the Lord afar off. And they remain on the outskirts of the camp. They are with the church, but not really a part of the church. The worldly element is always seeking to bring into the church worldly pleasures and worldly policies. And it seems impossible for them to distinguish between right and wrong between what is appropriate and what is not, what God approves and what he is not. And because they are spiritual midgets, because they're spiritual dwarfs, their standards are so low. They trail in the dust. And is this mixed multitude that prevents so many from hearing God's voice in the church. And they have kept modern Israel, modern Israel wandering around in the wilderness of sin. They have kept back the blessings of the early and latter reign. They have delayed the coming of Christ. Can, can I be honest with you? Yeah. Can I? Yeah. I mean, hey, hey, tomorrow we go home. Yeah. Let, me, let, me, let me give you an illustration. Mixed multitude. A number of years ago, I did a week of prayer in Atlanta. I can tell you the name of the church. Some of y'all know that. A number of years ago, I did a week, week of prayer there. I preached Sabbath, Sunday, Monday morning. Me and my team were in the hotel. The pastor knocks on the door. Open the door. Oh, pastor, how are you doing? Hey, listen, uh, Pastor Gomez, we had a talk. Okay, sure, come on in. Well, listen, uh, you know. The things that you've been preaching, let me tell you something, Pastor Gomez. They are true. They are 100% true. Okay, amen. What's the problem? Listen, Pastor Gomez, what you have been preaching, I agree. Okay, what's the problem? But our church isn't ready for that just yet. So I'm sorry, but I'm shutting you down. He was adamant. In fact, just stay in your hotel. We will bring you your food. So you're telling me that your church is not ready for the strong meat of the word of God? How long have you been a pastor in this church? About eight, nine years. What have you been doing for eight, nine years that your church is not ready for the strong meat of the word of God? Mixed multitude! Dogs that cannot bark. <laughs> was like... They are the ones who mainly commit the abominations in the church over, over which the faithful will be sign and crying with the, when the seal of God is given. They are the foolish virgins. They're the evil servants that say in their hearts, my Lord delays his coming. And therefore, they become careless and worldly. And they are a menace to the progress of the movement and must be kept on the outskirts of the camp. They are a great mixture of strangers in the church. And it is they who prevent so many from hearing the voice of God in the church. Why? Please get this, young people, my friends, please get this. Because one of Satan's greatest weapons in these last days that he is using against God's people and especially against the young people is that of associations and relationships. Of joining them with those who are part of the mixed multitude. Those who are part, the, joining those who are not really a part of God's people. Are you following me? Yeah. Let's take it just a little bit deeper. A little bit deeper. John chapter 10. John 10. John 10. 
verse 1. When you're there, please say amen. John 10, verse 1, the Bible says, Verily, verily, I say unto you, He that enters not by the door into the sheepfold, but climbs up some other way, the same is a what? But he that enters in by the door is a what? Shepherd of the sheep. Watch this. To him the porter opens, and the sheep hear his what? And he calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. Verse 4. And when he puts forth his own sheep and goes before them, and the sheep follow him, for they know what? His voice. The sheep know the voice of the shepherd. And when the shepherd calls, the sheep follow. Verse 5. And a stranger will they not follow, but will flee from him, for they know not the voice of what? In 2022, as prophecy is being fulfilled before our very eyes, as probation is about to close, as God's truth is being attacked even from within. What voice are you following? You see, the stranger, the thief, he comes to kill, to destroy. Now follow me. Please follow me. The stranger, the thief, he doesn't want you to follow or hear the voice of God. He wants you to follow his voice. And it is his voice that leads to destruction. Now follow me. It may be fun at the moment. It may provide the pleasure of sin for a season. For a moment. But the end of following that voice will lead to death, destruction. It'll rob you of true happiness, of true joy, of true purpose and meaning in your life. Let's take this a little bit deeper. Go on somewhere. Look at the time. Why is it that the thief does not want you to hear the voice of the shepherd? Why? Look at verse 26. The Bible says, But you believe not, because you are not my sheep. As I said unto you, my sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. If he can prevent us from following the voice of the shepherd, then he has prevented us from being a sheep of the shepherd. And therefore, the shepherd will not recognize us as his own. You catch that? You're following. If the enemy can cause us to not hear and follow the voice of the shepherd, he has prevented us from being a sheep of the shepherd. And the shepherd will not recognize us as his own. What does the thief, who's a part of the great multitude, what does the thief use to prevent us from hearing and following the voice of the shepherd? No doubt many answers could be given to that. But I submit to you, that there's one thing, there's several things, we're going to make this quick, as quick as possible. I want to take advantage of the time. But there's two or three things I want to point out that the enemy uses to keep us from hearing and following the voice of the shepherd. The first one, it's a word that we hardly ever hear anymore in church. We hardly hear anymore. When I was growing up, I still heard that word 
in church. But now, we don't want to hear that word anymore. And what is that word? Worldliness. Worldliness. Follow me now. We have come to the place and time where we must ask, is it still a sin to be like the world? Is it? Don't sound convinced. <laughs> the truth of the matter is, God will never recognize a worldly person as his own. Never. Let me say that again. God will never recognize a worldly person as his child. Because contrary to popular opinion, not everyone is a child of God. By creation, yes. By relationship, most certainly not. By adoption, no way. John 15. John 15. I want to get some good before our time is up. John 15, verse 18. Watch this. If the world hates you, you know that it hated me before it hated you. If you were of the world, the world would love his own. But because you are not of the world, but I've chosen you out of the world, therefore the world hates you. Question. Are we supposed to get the world to love us? We are, we are not supposed to get the world to love us. In fact, the more we're like Jesus, the more the world's going to hate us. The more we stand for biblical marriage, the more they're going to hate us. The world is to hate us. The light that shines from our lives is to be a rebuke to the world around us. The difference between God's people and those who don't know the Lord is to be very, very visible. Come on now. I've said this little thing here before many times. I'm going to say it again for those who haven't heard this. It's not rocket science. Please hear this. If it looks like a duck, if it swims like a duck, if it eats like a duck, if it flies like a duck, if it quacks like a duck, if it smells like a duck, shoot, it must be a duck. Well, guess what? If you watch the movies of the world, if you listen to the music of the world, if you dress like the world, if you eat like the world, if you talk like the world, if you think like the world, well, shoot, you must be of the world, not of Jesus. Hearing God through relationships. Watch this. Great controversy. Page 48. Listen. 924. There is another and more important question that should engage the attention of the churches of today. No, there's a question we should be asking ourselves. The Apostle Paul declares that all who live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. Why is it then that persecution seems in a great degree to slumber? Have y'all been persecuted lately for your faith? The only reason is that the church has conformed to the world standard and therefore awakens no opposition. In other words, we are not a threat to Satan and his kingdom. And Satan says, listen, if they sit in the pew, that's all they do, leave them alone. They're not bothering me, I'm not going to bother them. My kind of Christians. The religion that is current in our day 
is not of the pure and holy character that marked the Christian faith in the days of Christ and his apostles. It is only because of the spirit of compromise with sin, because the great truths of the Word of God are so indifferently regarded, because there is so little vital godliness in the church, that Christianity is apparently so popular with the world. True Christianity hasn't changed. Quote, unquote, Christians have. And now watch this. Let there be a revival of the faith and power of the early church and the spirit of persecution will be revived and the fires of persecution will be rekindled. Let there be that revival reformation and let us start living like Jesus and start causing damage to Satan's kingdom. Persecution will quickly arise. But right now, I want to move on to one more point here. Go to Acts 17. Acts 17. Hearing God through relationships or not. I'm about, to, I'm about to make you all very uncomfortable right now. Acts chapter 17. And notice what the early church was known for. Acts 17 verse 6. When you're there, please say amen. Notice what the early church was known for. The Bible says, And when they found them not, they drew Jason and certain brethren into the, uh, unto the rulers of the city, crying, These that have turned the world upside down are come here also. Amen. What were they known for? Turning the world upside down with the gospel. Amen. Why? Because in the early church, they were so on fire, so in love with their God, they face persecution. They face the fire, the sword, the Colosseum with hungry lions. And they invaded Satan's kingdom. So much so that paganism began to tremble for its existence. Turn the world upside down. Today, Today, we have not turned the world upside down. The world has turned us upside down. To give you an idea, and I tell my kids this all the time. Early church, imagine. Imagine Las Vegas, Sin City, filing an official complaint against the Seventh Avenue Church. Why? You SDAs, you better stop. Because your preaching is taking our business. Because of your preaching, your witness, your lifestyle, the casinos are half empty. The strip clubs are empty. The brothels are empty. You're taking our business. Stop it. That's what's happening. Right now, it sounds, it sounds ridiculous. It sounds foolish. But that's what's happening in the early church. Let's take just a little bit deeper. A little bit deeper. Before we're going to sit close. What does the enemy use to prevent us from hearing the voice of God? Yeah, worldliness. I'm the waiter. But the enemy also uses relationships. And can I tell you one thing that is killing the church today? I'm the waiter. And I wish there were more young people here. But it's killing the church. When a member of God's church 
becomes romantically involved with someone not of God's church. We should have a whole series on that. I'm sorry. God forbids it. Don't get him at me. Take with the waiter. And today, it is a curse. I hear it all the time. But pastor, there are no young godly men in the church. But pastor, there are no young beautiful godly women in the church. Where are they? I had to go halfway across the world to find mine. Amen. I found mine at the airport in the Philippines. Long story. Amen. And you all seen her. She's beautiful, isn't she? Amen. Okay, watch this. The mixed multitude. Now, 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 I praise God because God is merciful. And sometimes he takes the wrong thing, and by his mercy, he turns to something good. But that does not make the wrong thing right. Okay? I mean, hey, God bless Abraham with Isaac, but he still messed up with Hagar. But why is this? Guys, please get this. Whenever a member of God's church becomes romantically involved with someone that is not a part of God's church, 100% of the time, the one that compromises is the SDA. The fact that you are in that relationship is already a compromise. Take it a little bit deeper. Just because you are a member of God's church don't mean you're part of God's church. And if you're in that age where you're looking for a lifelong companion, just because he or she is a member of your church don't mean he's a real member of God's church. Because they could be a mixed multitude. And how do you know who's a mixed multitude? Tell my kids all the time. Hey, you want to go on a date? Yeah, we're going to go. Hey, let's go watch Doctor Strange. Doctor Strange, come on. Mixed multitude. Mixed multitude. Hey, come on. Let's go, let's, let's go here Friday night and do this. That is not right on the Sabbath. Mixed multitude. Let's go out to lunch Sabbath after church. Mixed multitude. Messes young people, messes young people that book. Uh, yeah. Mixed multitude. <laughs> and Satan is destroying the church by having divided homes. Because, my friends, how does Satan attack the church? He attacks the church by attacking the families. Because a church is made of families. Why is a church messed up? Because a family is messed up. Could I take my gloves off? <laughs> I want to hear the, 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 the seminar by Pastor Johnson on, on the, the, the priest of the home. Let me tell you something boldly here right here. Take with the chef. If men, if men were doing their real divine appointed task as head and priest of the home, we would not have this nonsense of women's ordination. We would not have that nonsense. That exists because the men are failing. And the women have to pick up the slack because the men are failing. smiling but I beg my friends choose your associates 
and your friendships wisely. Because that's what Satan uses to bring you down. And if you want to witness to someone, if you want to witness someone to bring them over, you know, contrary to popular opinion, Jesus did not hang around sinners. They hung around him. You didn't catch that. He didn't hang out with them. They hung around him. In other words, they were always in his sphere of influence. You don't have to go to their sphere of influence. You bring them to our sphere of influence and witness to them. Because my friends, to be the light of the world, we can't be like the world. I don't want so hard to understand. Our, we are to reach the world. But to reach the world, we cannot be like the world. Why is that? Today, oh no, we got to be as much as it is possible. No, we don't. The light from the word of God shining through us is enough to draw them to us. I'm sorry, but I might get in trouble for this. But I see what happens in many of our youth gatherings at, at academy football tournaments and academy prayer conferences and Bible camps. And the way they are leading our young people, it drives me up the wall. Because I honestly believe that as the young people, they truly want to serve God. I believe that with all my heart. But they're being led astray. I forget, I was, I was, I was, I was, I was we're, we're up in, in just a second, but I, I, I was, I was at, 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 at a Spanish church in L.A. I was, I was, I was about to preach on a Friday night. We're do, I was doing a series that, that, that weekend, and, and I was open a Friday night. And I was sitting in the front pew waiting to preach. And literally five minutes before I preach, I get a text from one of my kids. This is about four or five years ago. Hey, Gomez, the speaker here at this Vespers for our football tournaments, he just said, don't worry about overcoming sin. Don't worry about perfecting your character. That is not important for salvation. Literally. And I'm like... And, and, and when I got to preach, you all think I'm not right now? When I got to preach, I was so incensed with that. Oh, my goodness. Associations, friendships, relationships, dating, courtship. If you are with the wrong one, it's going to bring you down. Hearing God through relationships. Let's wrap this up. What else does God use? I mean, does the enemy use? I praise God for Scott and Mary's presentation last night. Because what Satan also uses to bring us from the voice of God, entertainment, Instagram, Facebook, YouTube, Snapchat, TikTok, Twitter. The hours and hours and hours we spent on that. And sometimes even on Sabbath, we can't get off of that. So I'm, in closing, I'm going to make this challenge to you. And I make it everywhere I go. Ever I got closer. When you come down from this mountaintop, many of us here, I know that the Holy Spirit is working in our heart. And, and, and I don't know why we're so in love with this world. This world is sick. I mean, have you seen this world? This world is sick. So, 
deserve that. So when you get home, when's about time? In the name of the Lord, I challenge you. I dare you to do one thing. I dare you. I want you to take the Word of God in one hand and either take your cell phone or your remote control of the TV and put them side by side and leave them there for the entire week. And during the week, pay attention as to which of the two you use the most. And if we discover we're reaching for the remote control more than the Word of God, or reaching more for, for, for social media than the Word of God, I'm sorry. Unless things change, you're part of the mixed multitude. This serious, my friends. As Pastor Thomas said, we're not playing around here. It is a way to leave this game playing, playing games, guys. If heaven is our destination, it is time we get on the straight and narrow path. And some of you here, and you know who I'm talking to, you got to get up at stuff. And why? I'll tell you why. I'll tell you why. As we're closing. My little testimony. We're closing. I don't have a testimony like Pastor Mirage. You know, praise God I was never in the world like some have. I praise God for godly parents. They, they raised me up. I mean, I praise God by the time I got to my freshman year in college. By the time I was a freshman in college, I had already read Fears and Prophets, Desire of Ages, Great Conversy, Mrs. Young People. I, I read that already. And that's when I got to college, I'm like, something's wrong here. This is not right. And, 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 and I wish more would have come forward for the baptism appeal. Why? I was baptized at nine years old. It meant nothing to me. It meant nothing to me. My uncle baptized me. He's a pastor. Uh, I remember, I, I just remember going inside this one pool and I see my uncle. Oh, hey, what's up? You know, Omega, what's up? And come here. That, 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 that was my baptism. At the age of 29, I was already a pastor. But I knew I'm not baptized. I knew that. And I was always kind of upset at my father for baptizing me because he simply said, well, listen, your older brother's getting baptized, you get baptized. I always had that against him. And my father was a godly man. He taught me how to study the Bible. I praise God for my father. It wasn't perfect, but I praise God for my father. Passed away five years ago, I guarantee I'll see him again. I guarantee it. But I know I wasn't baptized. One Sabbath, at the age of 29, I was already a pastor. Some friends of mine that I was working with were getting baptized. And I was there supporting, getting baptized, praise God. And the Holy Spirit told me, Gomez, what are you waiting for? I heard his voice, what are you waiting for? And I said, Lord, if the pastor makes an appeal for rebaptism, I'm there right now. Within two seconds, someone's going to get rebaptized. I was like, who are you? Come forward. Just like yesterday, who are you? Pat, who are you? Someone's going to get Here I am. And at the age of 29, I got baptized for the first time. But what's my point? My point is, I see young people here. I see young people here. And I know that if they give their life fully to Jesus, you all could do what I'm doing here much better than I can. Much better than I can.
Well, the question is, guys, are you going to hear God or not? All these things, the entertainment, the movies, the media, social media, video games, relationships that are not proper, all these things are preventing us from hearing God's voice. And the Lord right now is saying, it's time to let that go. Let that go. It's amazing. And, and, and Brother Scotty Mayer didn't touch upon this, but I mean, I'm, I'm going to say it. How in the world can we? I mean, last night, he called it up perfectly. If you actually sit here and talk smack, talk trash about his wife, what's he going to do? Praise God, he, the old man is dead. He's not going to, you know, do a Will Smith. Praise God. He's a, but, but, okay, praise God. But, I mean, if someone's talking trash about, forget, forget my wife, if someone's talking trash about my kids right there, about them, I'm not, you know what, I don't got to hear this. I'm out of here. Disney is talking trash about our God. They declared war on God. And we don't get it. We don't get it. Why? Because we're so immersed in it that we can't see it. But right now, God is telling someone here, it's time to let that go. Because I got something so much better for you. My appeal tonight is real simple and direct. We're closing this mountaintop. Tomorrow morning we go, we go home. We go back. And I pray that those that we associate with will know, hey man, you've been with Jesus. But my appeal right now is, if you know that there's things in your life right now, be it a relationship, be it entertainment, movies, video games, be it, be it, be it some addiction, pornography, whatever, social media, and the Lord right now is calling you, my son, my daughter, it's time to let that go because this world is coming to an end and Christ is coming and he's coming soon. And it's your decision right now to say, Lord, yes, I love this. Yes, I love that. Yes, I'm into that. Yes, I love that. But Lord, I hear you that if I hold on to this, I can't be your child. If I hold on to this, I can't hear your voice and therefore I am not your sheep. And the price that Jesus paid to make you a sheep was so great. And I beg of you, don't step and trample over his bruised, broken body for you. So if it's your decision, your decision right now, Lord, enough is enough. My eyes are not focused on the kingdom, and I'm going forward. And I'm putting all this out of my life. But Lord, I need your help. I need your help. Because I can't do it without you. But if that's your decision, I invite you to come to the front right now. Why don't you come to the front right now? Time to put all these things away that distract, that entertain, that prevent us from hearing the voice of God. Is, my friends. God's calling you. God's calling you guys to take a stand. Take a stand. And let the world realize, let the world see, I've been with Jesus. You know that song, I Decided to Follow Jesus? You know the story behind that song? Powerful story. 
this one man, this one man in one of the islands, I forget which island it was, an island where they still had cannibalism and headhunting. The missionary hit that island. And this man gave his life to Jesus, which was forbidden. And they brought that man and his family. And they said, renounce this Jesus of yours. And he said, I have decided to follow Jesus. And he said, no turning back, no turning back. They killed his wife in front of him. Renouncer Jesus. I've decided to follow Jesus. No turning back, no turning back. They killed his children in front of him. Will you now renounce your Jesus? I've decided to follow Jesus. No turning back, no turning back. Amen. And finally they killed him. But he didn't turn back. And right now, God is asking you, will you decide to follow me and not turn back? And that is your decision yeah. to follow and not look back. Yeah. I'm, I'm going to leave you just a little bit longer. Someone's got to come forward. Yeah. Praise God, brother. Yeah. You know, my father, my father was a political prisoner in Cuba. He escaped in 1962. He was put in a concentration camp, one of those death camps. Why? His sole crime was being a Seventh Adventist. Six months in that camp. Six months in that camp. Amen. Amen. Six months in that camp. Six months in that camp. Hey, I love these guys. I'm sorry. I'm apologize for that. I love these guys. I love these guys. Six months in that camp, he escaped. And for one year, he was a fugitive in Cuba. Running from the military, running for his life. And he finally found a way to escape the island. And that was by swimming to Guantanamo Bay. He swam about two miles out into the ocean and about seven miles across. Testimony is amazing. That when I first heard that testimony when I was like seven years old, that testimony changed my life forever. The faith that he had in this God. But he tells a story. When he began swimming, when he began swimming, he swam maybe a quarter of a mile out into the ocean. And it was like 11 p.m. at night. And the week before that, a hurricane went through the island. The ocean was still rough. And as he's swimming, he stopped. And he turned around and looked back. And behind him, he saw the peaceful, beautiful lights of Cuba. And in front of him, a dark, angry ocean. And right there he says, I had to make a decision. And he said, I will not look back. And he tells me, he tells me, Edison, if I would have looked back one more time, you would not be here. If I would have looked back one time, one more time, I would have gone back. But he decided, I'm not going back. I'm not looking back. And he swam, and he swam for several hours. And I got to finish the story here. I'll avoid the sharks and like that. But you had all of that. It's a crazy testimony. Powerful testimony. And there's evidence that because, because when my father had a, a, a physical exam about three years before he passed away, the doctor examined him, and he saw what, what the doctor called a scar in his heart. And the doctor said, did you have some traumatic experience in your life that was 
terrifying, impacting, that was just frightening? Well, when I was swimming from the life, I found myself in a school of hammerhead, hammerhead sharks. And one of them stuck its head out right at me and looked at me. Just froze, what are you doing in the middle of the ocean? And I prayed, Lord, if you don't save me, I'm fish food. Leaving that story aside. Leaving that story aside. When he got to the base, he saw a soldier up there on the side of the cliff, the seaside right there. He whistled. And the soldier said, Oye, ven por acá, in Spanish. And my father's like, Oh man, where am I? I thought this was American. He's talking to me in Spanish. So he swam this way, and when they threw him the lifesaver, he saw the, the letters USA. He felt better. Oh. When they pulled him up, the very first thing that that soldier said before, who are you? Are you okay? What are you doing here? The very first thing he saw you and he told me you were coming. He saw you and he told me you were coming. You know, you only get it. And then he said, this is American territory? That's Cuban. You're free. And then my father asked him, whoa, 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 whoa. Who saw me and told you? God. And he never saw that soldier again while on base. But the point is, he did not look back. He did not look back. There's someone else who will say, Lord, enough is enough. I'm yours and I'm not looking back. Anybody else? Minutes are close. Anybody else? Amen. Let's pray. Amen. Let's pray. Father in heaven, Lord, we thank you so much for allowing us to be here on this mountaintop experience. And Father in heaven, Lord, I know that your spirit is working. I know your spirit is working, Father in heaven. And I know there's more out there who need to come and take the stand. But Lord, I'm standing here with my brothers and sisters in Christ here. I praise God for my friends here on my right. I pray, Father Heaven, that as we go back down this mountaintop, Lord, the enemy is going to attack. He's going to attack. He's going to want to bring back those old sinful habits. More time wasting on social media. More watching filthy things that talk trash about our God probably going back to friends that we have no business being with. But I pray, Father God, that we shall remember that we took a stand for you. And that when temptation comes, we will run to Jesus. Because in him is more than enough power to overcome any sin. So, Father, please, I pray for these young people that have stood up. I pray for everyone here under the sound of my voice. Lord, we don't know how many more COSs we're going to have. This was crazy. And tomorrow as we go home, Father God, we're not even guaranteed we're going to get home. There's no guarantee we're going to get home. We put that in your hands. We just pray that from this moment forward, as the song says, no turning back. Though none will follow, no turning back. Because I've made the decision. I've taken my stand. And here I stand on the word of God. Here I stand, though the heavens fall. Amen. Father, you need young people. Young people like these in my right. Who will be willing to do and dare for your cause. Lord, please, bless them. Yeah. Empower them. May they be a living witness of the power of the gospel in their lives. Lord, we have one more meeting tomorrow. And I pray that anyone who needs to make a decision 
Father, may you give them no rest tonight. Father, give them a miserable night. Tugging by your Holy Spirit. Hearing, you have to make a choice for me now. Because tomorrow's not promised. So, Father, we thank you. We praise you. And we submit ourselves into your hands. In Jesus' name, amen.